Welcome to the Cannabis Data Science Meetup Group. Be thinking about what you may want to do in a couple of weeks, because we'll actually have a meetup on April 20th. And so I was thinking we could maybe do something fun or special, since that's, as we've already shown statistically, that's one of the holidays that actually matters in the cannabis industry, or that we've been able to quantify at least. For example, Christmas looks like it may matter and some of the other holidays may matter, but with a auto regressive effect. So that would basically mean people are doing their shopping the day before Christmas Eve. They're doing their shopping perhaps before July 4th and not on July 4th. So that's tricky to parse out of the data. However, it's pretty readily clear that there is a relative increase on April 20th. To what extent, we still need to quantify that a bit better. Um, so, so be thinking, um, so that's what's coming up. Then. So I guess before we dive in, just to give everybody a chance to express what they may be thinking, questions on your mind, I guess, we could go around the group and everybody could mention something that they're interested in researching here. And how about you, Hector? Anything on your mind? No, I've just been researching like econometrics because it's not something that I ever encountered before. So I've just been trying to compile as much information as possible to try to catch up to what you're actually doing. Awesome. Well, really what we're doing here is we're first trying to just outlay a nice body of data science techniques we can use and also find places in the cannabis industry where they can be applied. Just essentially trying to answer questions that are on people's minds as we go about this. And we're basically just trying to, exactly like you said, get a nice understanding of the cannabis industry. And from what I've observed, there are people in the space doing statistics and analytics. But to me, it just looks like a lot of descriptive statistics. And as we'll get into today, you can go down as you may not wish to and make perhaps not the most optimal business decisions if you're simply looking at descriptive statistics. And so we'll get into that today specifically and we're about to open a can of worms here um, and we'll do our best to, to put everything back in properly. So, so you're in for a treat today, Hector. How about you, Charles? I know the game theory model from last week has some flaws that were catching your attention, but anything else on your mind? Um, actually, I'm going to go back and look at some of the work I did with um, testing testing time and uh, the Oklahoma data, um, and with the 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 quanti pulling out the quantities and stuff, and actually do some. Um, some descriptive statistics because I've been reading about, you know, and actually in from my experience with my last job, you know, you really have to like have a really good handle on the data in order to start doing any kind of modeling. Um, so the more you understand, the more th that descriptive statistics you do, the better your model is going to be. And the better, and also the better the chance that your model is actually going to work. Spot on. And I didn't mean to bash descriptive statistics too much because as you were actually pointing out, the better we get an understanding of our data, the better models we can build. So the better we know about what values may be missing, if there may be some miscoded values, categorical variables, what categories can they take, what do they take, what's the proportion. So all of these things definitely matter. And so I love your approach here. So I think it's just a, the, the end goal is still having a nice model for inference. 
So I think you're right. I think we can go quite far with the descriptive statistics. I just think uh, so. Not to knock the descriptive statistics too much, but I think we're I think we're all on the right right track here. So, so long story short, I'll, I'll be looking forward to conversing with you about some of the discoveries you may make along the way. So we'll, we'll retouch that here in a second because I, I still need to parse out my thoughts a little, I think. So, so Jerry, anything on your mind? Well, I'm just, uh, I had a hell of a weekend at least <laughs> on, on other matters. So uh, I didn't get a lot of time to spend on cannabis. I did pick up that New Jersey's coming online real soon. Uh, and I was wondering, though, just on this discussion here, uh, yeah, we've been doing uh, descriptive. Are we going to be getting into doing prescriptive or predictive? Which, which, which way do you think we might be? And also, uh, the question that, that's always on my mind is, you know, when and how do we publish these, these things? Brilliant, brilliant questions. And I think you're following it through to the logical conclusion. And I, so I think this is ultimately what I wanted to get to was Charles is right. The descriptive statistics are critical to make sure we're heading in the right path. We're not making errors. We're building proper models. I just want to emphasize that, you know, from speaking with people, as a data scientist, you can't just put out statistics and leave it there, right? You have to essentially help your audience. You have to help them understand the statistics. And uh, even better, a lot of the times these may be business managers. They could even be regulators. They could be consumers trying to make better decisions. So ultimately, people are trying to make better decisions. And as Bayesian agents, they're gathering data, which are our statistics, and ultimately they're trying to make a better decision. So I, would, I know, would think that a lot of the descriptive stuff we've been doing would be of interest to consumers. I don't see it being of great interest to uh, anybody in, in the business, anybody in the industry. Hopefully we can connect some pieces because we would ultimately like to help everyone, right? Consumers, producers, and regulators. So everybody who touches the space. And so I think maybe that maybe where some of our shortcoming is, is how can we def define our inferences a little bit better and help guide decisions better. So ultimately we do want to make predictions and we may need to write a bit more about our predictions so that they can be prescriptive for people. So people can see, okay, based on the data, do we want to raise or lower prices? Or As what, you what, you know, what, uh, what do we want to grow? I mean, which of the uh, strains do we want to grow? Okay. A, a, a prescriptive thing. Definitely. So I think a couple things need to happen. One, we need to make sure we're asking the right questions. So that was the, the lesson of the week last week was, you know, we need to, well, we need to define our questions well. So that way we actually know what we're going about trying to answer. And so we've done a lot of exploratory analysis and I think, well, we're all agents in the, the space and we've all spoken to a lot of people. So I think we, like, so for example, I kind of have an idea of questions on people's mind, but I think we just need to formulate the questions a little bit better. So that way we can actually have concrete business decision decisions. So for example, you know, in the coming months, we think it would be the most profitable to open a 
this type of production in Massachusetts. So well, we did notice seasonality and growth patterns. Exactly. So we've done some statistics on seasonality. And so I think the next step would be making predictions about what will happen in future seasons. And then even better if we couldn't make recommendations to producers, regulators, and consumers about decisions they need, need to make. So first off, we just need to figure out decisions that people are making and then think about, you know, any way that we could shed light on that and help people make better decisions. So a little abstract, we'll try to tie everything down today, but I, I like the, the way you're thinking, Jerry. Well, if you're on board, we, we can go ahead and try to tie everything down. Um, instead of uh, being in abstract land. So let's see if we can't tie down some of these abstract ideas into real world business deci decisions that people could make. Welcome to the 60th episode. So we've done an entire year now, so we're getting up there in the numbers. I was reviewing some of the prior weeks we've done, and we've covered quite a handful of interesting topics. So in fact, we can even start to tie in some of the things we've learned to some of the past topics. And so we'll, we'll touch on that briefly today. So this was on Charles's mind and I thought I would address utility today. So we're specifically talking about consumer choice. And I just wanted to talk to you about how economists model choice versus how marketers may view choice and why that matters with our analysis. So I got really bogged down with utility when I was in graduate school and I knew this in the back of my head, but it's not really until I started to do a lot of empirical work where this sort of made sense to me. So essentially utility is a theoretical concept and ultimately we're basically trying to tie together an abstract notion, which are called economists like to just term preferences. So how much do people enjoy one good versus another one outcome versus another, and then actually tie that into how people actually act, because this is what you observe right? You actually observe people's behavior. Preferences are not something you observe. This is just a theoretical construct that has its use in explaining what we observe. So people, so I put this photo here because, right, obviously, or there's a group of scientists, right? And they're trying to figure out, okay, you know, what's actually going on in the brain when you make decisions? What does happiness look like in the brain? And that's real interesting work, but it's not necessarily necessary for modeling what for modeling outcomes and making predictions. So a critical leap in economic thought is understanding that agents don't necessarily have to have utility as long as 
they behave as if they had utility. So do people actually have utility functions? You know, d you know, does it matter if, you know, somebody's emotion is, you know, happiness or satisfaction or there's a wide range of emotions. So, you know, this is kind of abstract and, you know, people are trying to tie this into like, brain chemistry, but we can kind of abstract that away and, okay, we just say, okay, do people have utility functions? It doesn't really matter for what we're saying. All that matters is that people behave as if they are trying to get some abstract satisfaction that we'll call utility from believing that they've satisfied their preferences. Just quick aside, the believing is actually a critical part here. So for example, my research in graduate school was on charitable giving. And a interesting observation that's been made with charitable giving is people still get satisfaction from giving to charity, whether or not their donation actually ends up with the group that they donated to, right? So, and this is unfortunately why you see a lot of charitable organizations have very little, have very low pass-through rates to the group that they may be, um, you know, out there saying their, their, their donations are going to. Because when the economists would argue that charitable organizations, uh, you know, an economic entity in, in and of itself, and, you know, it recognizes that as long as people believe that their donations are going to a good cause, they, they'll, they'll satisfy their preferences. So belief and it doesn't have to be charity. Uh, it can be anything. Um, if people believe that driving a flashy sports car makes people think highly of them, it doesn't actually matter if people think highly of them or not, as long as they believe that people do. So, so that's an, so I just want to, there's another stress possibility here because I, it's um, going to be important. Yeah. Another, there's another possibility here of what if also what, how just, you here, to, just because this is an important assumption here, which I got hung up on in graduate school and I think a lot of economists get hung up on and in fact there's a lot of work being done today on what's called social choice theory which is basically just summing up people's utility but classical economists um we're not, we're not even classical economists but you know I you know, economists who have been teaching for many, many years, they, they generally frown upon comparisons um, of utility and trying to sum up utility. Because basically the idea is, you know, how are you supposed to compare how happy one individual is to, you know, how happy another individual is? You know, the idea is, you know, this is not really apples to apples and it's not really necessary for, for what we're doing, right? So remember, we're just saying, okay, agents act as if there is utility um, and then we'll just look at their actions. 
you know, we don't need to be summing up utility. That's a bit of a tangent. I just kind of wanted to, to throw that in there because I think this is an important concept um, that I personally had a tough time grappling with for many years. But as I said, the more empirical work I do, the, the more I realize how it's just sort of a, a useful construct utility is because, you know, what do we actually observe? right? At the end of the day, we observe prices. We observe people's consumption. And we basically have to make an inference about their preferences. So we can make a lot of inferences without, you know, worrying too, too much about say the the specific form of the utility function you know as long as it satisfies various properties so that was that was a, a bit of a tangent down into economics so now i'll try to back that out into just you know how does this matter when you're running your business so the way marketers usually think about consumers is, you know, your consumer is the people that actually purchase your product. Well, economists view consumers as anyone who has a preference for your product. So that would be people that are buying your product, but that would also potentially be people who aren't buying your product, but they may under certain circumstances. So this is um, an illustration of this, where this consumer is just buying good X and they're not buying good Y. They're indifferent between any combination of X and Y that follow, that falls on what's called an indifference curve. So they're indifferent between any amount of X and Y that falls along that line. They've got a budget so they can afford any combination of good X and Y that falls along their budget. And that depends on the price of good X and good Y. And basically they try to get the most utility they can. And it's possible that they'll just buy all of good X or if the price of good X increased drastically, they may only buy good Y. So long story short is just because a consumer isn't buying your product doesn't mean they wouldn't if factors change. So if prices change on your good or even a substitute good, then people may start buying your product. Okay. So why is this important here? Um, well, it's essentially I'll get to this here in a second, but there's basically two effects going on here. There are people who are buying your product. And then as the price changes, they'll either buy more or less of your product. But also as the price changes or other prices change, there may be consumers who stop buying your product or start buying your product. So you run into a zero bound. Um, so, right, you can't purchase, you know, a negative amount of cannabis. Um, so, so, th so this is, this is going to be important. Um, so real quick, just to outline the steps we'll go through. 
basically we'll design our experiment. We'll state our hypothesis. We'll collect data. We'll test our hypothesis. And then we'll try to reproduce this study. So basically, this is the question that's come up. So there was an influential, I would, I guess you would call retail manager that I heard speak. And he expressed concern that inflation was going to be a problem that nobody in the cannabis industry is prepared for because this isn't something we've observed yet to date in the cannabis industry. So nobody knows how it's going to affect various aspects of the industry. And one would argue it's going to affect every aspect of the cannabis industry because we just saw that prices of other goods matter, right? So just because somebody is not consuming cannabis, if other goods change, they may start. Or say if somebody is consuming cannabis and the prices of other goods change, they may stop consuming cannabis. So it's all so specifically today we'll look at the demand side. We can look at supply side factors in upcoming weeks because inflation will inevitably affect the supply side, right? Just think about wages increasing, input prices increasing. The, and and that'll do it. The, that I mean, that's a major major influence on supply right there. So so supply is going to be affected, and then demand is going to be affected twofold. So first, you know, just the prices of other goods varying may affect how much cannabis consumption. And I would love to disentangle this into two different effects where you basically have the proportion of people who use cannabis. And then there's going to be the quantity of cannabis that's actually consumed by people who consume cannabis. And I would just like to say that I think this is a question that the cannabis data science group is uniquely poised to answer because we've got the skill set. We've got, you know, the ambition and the motivation to calculate these statistics. And as I'll point out later, I don't think anyone else has a really good incentive to calculate these statistics. And why would we want to disentangle this effect? Well, about 40 years ago, an economist showed that if you don't take into account the fact that people may choose to participate or not, right? And you're just estimate your model based on quantity without, especially in markets where a large proportion of people opt out and this, these models have been applied to the tobacco industry. So how many people choose to smoke cigarettes and given that they choose to smoke, how much they choose to smoke. And so I thought it would be quite a good model to use 
in the cannabis industry because you have two effects. You have people who are choosing to use or not use cannabis. And given that they're choosing to use cannabis, they're going to determine how much they use. And then the idea is if you don't take into consideration the degree that people opt in or opt out, you may end up with biased and worse inconsistent results. And to, to give you an idea of this, at this moment, hundreds of cannabis retailers pay $300 to $600 a month for descriptive statistics about cannabis sales. Well, those are descriptive statistics that aren't taking into consideration if people are participating at higher or lower rates. And so you'll see this company put out statistics saying, oh, the amount of adults ages, you know, X through Y, you know, th that's increased this year by, by 5%. And so if you were making your business decision, based on, okay, you know, we think there's going to be, you know, 5% more retired people shopping. Well, that 5% may have been true in 2021, but you can get a whole lot more data in 2022, and it's going to be, it may be inconsistent. So you may take the exact same measurement in 2022, and it may be a 15% increase, or it may be a 15% decrease. So it doesn't even matter how many, you know, retailers they get on board. So they may just try to get more and more and more and more data but they're going to be inconsistent. So it doesn't even matter how many retailers they sample. The results will simply, you know, the results may change, you know, the more and more retailers they sample. And then we were talking about, even if you have a biased result, you can work with that because you, you know, the bias may be a positive or negative bias. But, you know, if you're consistently biased, that's manageable. But if you're inconsistent and you're biased, then if you try to make a business decision, I would argue you're not going to make the best business decision you can. So basically, the point being is, say you're trying to understand how many adults are going to be purchasing cannabis in 2022. As we talked about in prior weeks, my belief is any number is better than no number. So in forecasting, a naive forecast is simply using what happened yesterday to predict what happened in the future. So right now, people are paying $300 to $600 a month for a naive forecast that's probably biased and inconsistent. And that's the best that they can do for making their decisions. So as I said, you know, a naive forecast, you know, what happened yesterday will assume that's what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, a naive forecast, it's a good benchmark just to, to see if your model is, has any predictive power whatsoever. And as I said, any number is better than no number. So that's why people are paying, you know, 600 bucks a month 
to get descriptive statistics because they just need any number. They just need any number they can just so that they kind of have a ballpark of where, where, where they're at. But I would argue, you know, if you're trying to make a business decision, so say you're, you would say, oh, you know, we think there were, you know, 15% more adult users, this, I mean, like uh, retired users, and you try to, to do marketing towards, towards that group. Well, inflation may hit and all of those retired consumers may stop participating. They may say, oh, our other prices have gone up. We're going to stop participating. Um, or you may have other people and, th and they say, oh, prices of maybe pharmaceutical drugs have gone through the roof. Those prices have gone through the roof. I'm now going to start consuming cannabis. So my argument is if you actually want to have a good idea of who will be buying your products, it's critical to, to model both who's going to be participating and then the quantity that they consume. And from a statistical lens, even if we can have, you know, even if there's a lot of missing data, so even if we don't get the best model in the world, if we at least make an effort, any effort at all to model participation and quantity, then we may end up with estimates that are unbiased and consistent. And so I would argue, yes, you know, this company has better data than we have, but if we model things appropriately, we may actually be able to make better predictions um, than someone who doesn't use these statistical methods. And like I said, there's no reason why they couldn't use these methods, but I was thinking about this and the trouble that analytics companies run into is how do you convince somebody that your analytics are worth paying for? And it's a very intangible product. So analytics, how do you even measure the value of that? You would actually need analytics of your analytics to measure their value and then right then you kind of run into the okay so you know right can you use your own analytics to measure the value of your analytics so long story short would they sell more analytics if they hired an economist to estimate a heckman model for them or would they sell more analytics if they spent $150,000 on Instagram ads. Well, I observe these companies spending large amount of money on Instagram ads, and I don't see them spending a lot of money on economists. So not to throw them under the bus because, you know, they have incentives and like it or not, if they can make people believe that their analytics are worth paying for, it doesn't matter if their statistics are biased and inconsistent, if people believe that they're getting value from them. My personal belief is games like that only work in the short run and don't work in the long run. So that's why I believe you want to stick with the best business decision you can, 
if you want to be around in the long run. So, so long story short, you know, if I was a manager, I would want statistics on what's going to be the change in the proportion of people consuming cannabis coming in the next year, as well as the change in quantity of those consumers. So steep demands, even for ourselves here at the Cannabis Data Science Group. So this is going to be sort of, at least for me, uh, a pet project for, for this week and next week. So, so, so come on Saturday morning, because on Saturday morning, we'll fit a Heckman model. So that way we can see if we can't have unbiased, consistent results for the quantity of cannabis and the proportion of cannabis consumers in 2022. Um, so here I'll get to the data, but basically the point is both participation and consumption matter. So like I said, I'm not sure if I did the best job, um, trying to hammer that home, but I think particularly for cannabis, I think it matters, right? Because it, it, as I said, it doesn't matter the degree it matters. It depends on, you know, the amount of people opting out. So if participation is ubiquitous, you know, this isn't really like something we really have to worry about, but cannabis in a way is similar to tobacco in that, you know, a large amount of people don't consume cannabis and, you know, why, why is that? Um, you know, are they interested, but they just haven't purchased, are they purchasing a substitute product? So maybe they're on heavy painkillers or maybe they consume a lot of alcohol or maybe they consume tobacco. They may view those as imperfect substitutes. And so maybe if the price of tobacco increased or the price of painkillers or TV or whatever they view as a substitute increases, maybe they'll, they'll substitute towards cannabis. And essentially we could view, you know, illegal cannabis as a substitute. Um, I think that's maybe a good way to conceptualize it. Illegal cannabis would just be an imperfect substitute that hasn't gone through quality control testing and carries risk because you could get arrested for possessing illegal cannabis. So that's the way I like to conceptualize illegal cannabis is a, is an imperfect substitute. Um, but if you have any thoughts on that, definitely, definitely share. Okay. I just sort of wanted to express those ideas. As I said, I still am trying to better formalize the, the question at hand. But, and Jerry, I think this may, uh, and to tie this into, okay, how could you use this information to make better business decisions? Well, say your product, you think, okay, high income people or people with high income may buy a larger quantity of this, well, it'd be useful to know if in that particular neighborhood, 
what's the proportion of people who are actually consuming? So yes, maybe your high income may make you buy more beverages, but maybe there's another factor going on that would make people not participate whatsoever, even, even with their high incomes. So long story short is, um, I think managers could benefit from knowing the proportion of people participating. And then of course, regulators, this would be of top concern for a regulator. So this is historically how people have measured cannabis consumption, right? They basically look at, you know, teenagers or high schoolers, and they want to know, you know, what proportion of, you know, youths are consuming cannabis. And, you know, if you're a regulator, you may not want to see a spike in the proportion of youths consuming cannabis. So, so if you're a regulator, this would be a, a brilliant model for you to use because you could parse out the quantity that youths consume as well as the proportion of youths consuming. Um, right, because you may want to mitigate against that. Um, so, and then I guess it could help consumers too, if you're looking for the social consumption lounge and you may want to live in a locality with a high proportion of consumers, but, but anywho, I thought this, que this question was of interest. Um, if there are any thoughts, comments, questions, you know, feel free to, to put them in the chat and then we can start looking at some data. For Hector's question, the, the, as for the, the quantity of cannabis, that's actually something we're explaining. So, so you'll see on Saturday, Hector, with the, with the Heckman model, we simultaneously can predict both the increase in quantity, say from a change in income, or specifically today we're worried about a change in inflation. So as inflation increases or decreases, we can both estimate the increase in quantity that may happen as well or decrease in quantity and the increase or decrease in participation. So we can actually estimate both with the Heckman model. And that's why it's the model of choice. Uh, it's the best model to use in this scenario. Um, as I said, the Heckman, the Heckman model is great for many, many scenarios. It just happens to be especially suitable for the cannabis industry. And in fact, I've been wanting to use it to model cannabis consumption since I first learned about this model many years ago in graduate school. To be honest, I had actually forgotten about it until we recovered it in Saturday morning statistics last week. And then this past week, I've just been thinking more and more about it. And it's, it's the model of choice. If you want to model cannabis consumption, like this, this is the way to go. Um, because anecdotally you'll bump into people and they'll say, oh, you know, um, at the end of the month, um, you know, I'm stopping, I'm going to quit using cannabis and you say, and then you'll you know, why is that? And they're like, oh, uh, you know, I'm starting a job here or there. So, you know, participation rate may be correlated or may be explainable by employment rate. So the employment rate, which is intimately tied with inflation, will perhaps be a good explainer for both if people use cannabis and if they do the amount they use.
Okay, tons of theoretical data or theoretical points there. Now we can get into some computer science and statistics to kind of round out the day and have a nice, a nice fun time at it. So I should have actually already committed this. Um, I'll, I'll commit this code right after the meetup. But I wanted to share this wrapper that I wrote with you and see if any of you had ways that you might may like to improve upon it or use it. So the Massachusetts Cannabis Control Commission has recently migrated their data to this data catalog. So we've worked with this data in the past through Socrata. However, we now need a novel way to get our paws on all of this data. So, so I defined a few fields here. I'll explain these down below. But essentially, for the computer scientists in the audience, Oh, is it already 11.30? Okay, somehow uh, time flew today. Um, so, so I'll go through this uh, relatively quickly. So hopefully you can all stay for five more minutes. Um, so I'll, I'll let the, the computer scientists look through this, but basically I just repurposed this metric class that I had written as an interface to the metric API. And this is just a, a simple class to interface with the Cannabis Control Commission. Um, so I'll let the computer scientists scroll through this. This is simply an object that makes requests to the API for us and cleans up the responses um so so that's so I'll, I'll show you how to to use it um kind of abstract away the code for those of you who are interested in the code check out check out the open data package um, which may end up being part of canlytics in the near future um because i think it's a useful tool so I'll show you how the tool is used real quick. Um, so in the next five minutes, we'll take a look at inflation. On Saturday, we'll actually model inflation to see how that affects participation and consumption. And then next Wednesday, we'll sort of go back over our analysis just um, for the general group, just so that we can understand how we can use it to make inferences. So basically, Saturday morning statistics will go deep on the methodology and then bring it back next Wednesday for how, how it can be used. But just if you'll stay for three more minutes, I'll just show you the inflation rates in Massachusetts. And I think businesses in Massachusetts could benefit from this. So just to show you real quick how the wrapper is used. You basically just create a client here and you know it's got all of its nice useful functions. And then you can do cool things like you can get all the licensees in, in Massachusetts. And Massachusetts does a great job at adding many fields. So tons of data to explore here. Um, just, uh, you know, check it out. Uh, so, so, and I said, if you've got any suggestions about how to improve the code, feel free to share. So 
just go ahead and get all of this data. So basically, this is, you know, all of the data that you can retrieve from the Cannabis Control Commission. So this is going to be the retrieval of these data sets here. And so we've got, you know, everything under the sun here. Specifically, we're concerned with sales. So here are just gross sales. And then I think I've already run this, but here we have sales by product type. So we've got buds, vape, so on and so forth. And we know it's in grams. We know the total revenue. And we even have the, we should have the quantity right here. So we've got the quantity and the price and the unit of measure. So we had to do a lot of wrangling to get all those data points in Washington state. We have them right out of the gates in Massachusetts. Super quick tangent here for Jerry's sake, since I know Jerry gets a kick out of this. Um, you can oh, look at the, the breakdown of indoor ver versus outdoor. And Massachusetts, I believe, is the only state that you can find that statistic. So over the next week, I'll encourage you all to check out each of these data sets because I think there's a treasure trove of statistics hiding in here that we haven't yet calculated. So just to end today real quick, you can split up the sales by the different product types. So, you know, flour, oil, vape, beverage, edible pre-roll. Here I'm lumping together infused and non-infused pre-rolls. Then you can calculate for flour and oil, price per gram, and the rest will be price per unit. And then, I may have messed this up. Um, and then you can calculate the inflation rate for the various, yes, I did mess this up. Um, okay, so here we're, just going to do daily and have to, to turn it into monthly afterwards. That's okay though. So for example, here's the price per gram of flour. So you can see flour prices slowly diminishing and, you know, we, um, um, okay, let's just put this in like this. Okay, so now we can, sorry to do this so quickly. I did, didn't budget uh, time very well today. But you can look at the monthly price of flour. And then you can actually look at the rate of inflation of flour. So that we'll just look at it for the past year. So you've actually had deflation in cannabis flour prices. And historically, this is what you observe in the cannabis industry is deflation because you're basically having a lot of suppliers come online. It, there's a lot of factors. Uh, the, the level of risk 
is coming down. So there's a lot of deflationary factors. And so the point being is if there's inflation of other products, how is the cannabis industry going to handle this? Um, so real quickly, I'll just show you the rest of these series here. Ah, uh, man. Okay. Um, I think the pre-rolls may just be... Okay, so the, yeah, this pre-rolls was the problem there. Okay, so... Just to, to plot the rest of these, and I'll let you get out of here since we've stayed well way over time here. Great. I think um, I forget what the the baseline U.S. inflation rate is, but I forget if even the monthly one. But I think typically maybe around two percent. Um, so, you know, here if we just look at the last year. But a mean of almost zero. So oil prices are staying about the same, with maybe a, a little bit of a tail off there. And then just to, just to show you the rest of these series here. So vape cartridges leveling out. Beverages, check this out, beverages, slight inflation going on with beverages, same with edibles. So, so long story short, this is going to be something to watch for is one inflation of other products because as we pointed out earlier, you know, the, the prices of other goods matter. So it's not impossible that if the prices of other goods increase dramatically, you may have people stop consuming cannabis, right? I mean, think about that. I mean, if, you know, if gas went through the roof, if food prices went through the roof, if your housing prices went through the roof, you may just have to recalibrate and say, okay, I can't afford to buy cannabis. So it wouldn't be impossible that you have people exit cannabis consumption. One could even argue you have people enter, right? you see cannabis consumption increase as incomes decrease. So you could even have an, an income effect where prices of everything increases, people's overall, you know, well-being decreases, and they may end up consuming more cannabis because of that. So, so that's a factor. So how does inflation affect people participation rate and then of course how does it affect their actual quantity purchased um so we'll start modeling that next week you know we'll actually get the cpi data consumer price index so general measure of prices we'll get that from the federal reserve We'll augment it with some census data that we may think is relevant for preferences. And then we'll fit a Heckman, or you can know it as a Tobit. So we'll fit our Tobit model and see if we can't predict both participation rates and consumption rates in Massachusetts. We'll, we'll do it in Washington state too. 
So that will be our reproducibility. So we'll make predictions in Washington state and in Massachusetts. You could reproduce this in any other state you wish. And then we'll see how well our predictions matched. And I wanted to do this today. I did not save enough time, but we've actually made predictions. We actually made forecasts for 2022 um, back in back in October here. Um, so I kind of wanted to take a, a little bit of time and look at our our forecasts and see how they those compare to the actual inflation and sales that we observed in the first quarter of 2022. So we can measure how well our forecasts did, and then we can revise our forecasts for the next three quarters of 2022 and, and see you know, if we can't hone in our forecasts. So, so didn't get as far as I would have liked today, but that's okay because we're going to, this is a big question. So we're essentially, we're, we're, we're taking it a little slow and we're making sure we set up our experiment correctly and make sure that we have all the data for the question at hand. So we're, we're approaching it slow, but as I said, you know, I don't think anybody else in the cannabis industry has the incentive to rigorously answer this question the way that we can. So a philosophy of canalytics is the tortoise always beats the hare. So yes, we're moving slow, but we're moving in the right direction. And so, yes, there are hairs out there and they're estimating, frankly, what I'm worried are biased, inconsistent results. And they're, you know, they're, they're, they're off to the races estimating these. But like I said, I'm a little skeptical about them. And I think we can approach this problem slow, methodically, and we'll walk away at the end of the day with statistically unbiased, consistent pr predictions. So yes, other people may have better data than we can, but we can come with a rigorous approach and help people make the best business decisions that they can. So until next week, you know, if you have nice formulations of questions, or if you have any questions yourself, please feel free to, to chime in. So I know I was sort of all over the board today. Hopefully you may have found it interesting and found something useful in there. Any thoughts, comments, questions before we call it a day? Good to see you too, Jay. Um, so, sorry for throwing you in on the, the deep end with economics, but basically the lesson of the day is it matters who consumes cannabis as well as how much the consumers consume. So to just make sure to, to, to keep this in mind because I think this is going to be a major factor in coming years. As cannabis is becoming more mainstream, there's less of a stigma to using cannabis. So people may start using it more. People may gravitate away from substances like, I hope they gravitate away from like things like alcohol or heavy pain pills. That's my subjective preferences. Um, but 
but long story short, we're just here to observe. So we'll observe. Um, we'll observe what people do, and you know th th that's all we can do at the end of the day is we observe people's behavior, we observe prices, and we can do our best to make inferences about their preferences. So that way, we can try to make rational business decisions. So. I keep long windows mixed up. <laughs> Can you say that one more time, Jay? Oh, I just said I keep getting my time zones mixed up. That's why I was oh, like, today. <laughs> not the end of the world. Time zones are tricky. <laughs> yeah. No, I caught the tail end of it. It's pretty interesting stuff you're doing. Cool. Well, I'll get it uploaded quickly. And then, as I said, feel free to chime in because I don't want to go too far down the economics rabbit hole since I know we're all here for data science plus cannabis. So don't let me get too lost in the economics weeds. And Jerry and everybody else, you're doing an awesome job keeping us focused at the end of the day on actionable business decisions that people can make. So I uh, just want to point out one thing, piece of information. I... Can you say that one more time, Jerry? Senator Schumer said that they would be introducing a bill to legalize marijuana nationwide. That would be incredible. And so talk about reduced stigmatization. So if something like federal legalization were to happen, participation rate is of utmost importance because it doesn't matter how well you've made descriptive statistics. Don't hold your breath. It's just being introduced. True. But it's something to think about because it's coming. True. And exactly. And so I think this is where we can really make an impact is if we have a nice predictive model, we can make predictions that people who are just using descriptive statistics can't. So, so, so it, it, you know, the long run is where models like this really come in handy. And so, I don't know, I still need to parse out my thoughts a little more. As you can tell, I'm still chewing all of this in my head. So thank you for letting me express my thoughts and sort of talk out loud today. So as I said, trying to bring this all together in the next week or two. So I think we'll have some good insights, but just have to start piecemeal, start getting something out there on the table. So. But, you know, looking at your plots, um, there's obviously some missing data, um, and, you know, in order for your predictions to be fairly accurate, you need to fill in that, do the best that you can to fill in that missing data, do some, you know, whatever research it takes, and also make sure that your data is clean. Because if you're making models with, you know, with dirty data, missing data, your predictions are going to be way off. And again, this is, I'm, you know, I, I'm really going to keep pushing this because this is a huge problem with people, you know, who, who claim to be data scientists, but don't do the data science part before, you know, before making models. Just making models without looking at your data and cleaning your data and fixing your data, you don't, you know, it, it's, it's not data science. It's just, you know, it's just pushing some buttons. Um. And, and this is why I love having veteran data scientists like yourself in the group, because you keep us on our toes. Because as you pointed out, you can, you can run into situations where you're putting faith into a model that's built on shoddy data, or it could be cleaned up a bit. So I think, I think you're spot on, Charles. And in fact, all the work you've done with the descriptive statistics, it, it adds so much value because Right, you're, I'm kind of guilty as you described. I'm always off to the races trying to estimate the model 
And I love how you don't cut corners. You do a nice analysis of what data may be missing because you're right. It, and in fact, we briefly touched on this about how it may even be better to impute missing values than just ignore them entirely. Um, yeah, you should do some kind of research as to figure out how to fill those values in. Um, you know, I look if you look at that, if you look at the Oklahoma data, I mean, I went and I looked up those cities and I found what county they were in and I filled in the missing counties. Nice. Um, you know, that, that's the level of data cleaning you should be doing to make accurate models. Spot on. And technically that, that would be an imputation, right? The county is missing and you, it's an easy data point to predict because the, the city is always going to be in that county. Um, but that was technically an imputed value. And you're right, it leads to a better model because otherwise you would just drop the missing observations and that would introduce bias into your results. So you end up with less bias by filling in those missing values and potentially no bias if you fill them incorrectly. So yeah. spot on Charles. So please, please keep, continue keeping me and everyone else on our toes because that, that's, what, that's what we're here for, right? is the idea is, you know, if we put all of our great minds together, then we can just come up with, you know, better and better research, better and better science. Another uh, news flash that just came into my email as we were talking is New York State has opened up a uh, cannabis uh, website from the Cannabis Control of the Workforce Development. Uh, I'll put the link in the chat if anybody wants to look at it. Oh, I'll, ch I'll check this out. This let me, let me see what they said. New York State Department of Labor is art launching a new cannabis workforce site. Okay, so this is for jobs in the cannabis industry. Ooh. And then just, just came in. I, I didn't even have a chance to read the email. I opened it, saw the link, put it in the chat. And since you all came today, I'll go ahead and give you something of value too. So here is a link to all of the Washington State, what's called CCRS. So that's their new traceability system built by the state of Washington. And so this is all of their data through March 12th. And so it's time to start wrangling this data. And so I just got a hold of this last night. And so I haven't had time to look at it yet even. So we are on you, top of the news here. So if any of you want to start taking a stab at that in coming weeks, we can look at this data because yet again, we can compare our predictions. We made predictions for Washington state. And so we can now compare our predictions with the actual, see how far we were off and see if we can't do better in the future. So. Too cool. Well, we've stayed way over time, so I love it that hopefully you're getting something out of the group. And as I said, feel free to shoot a message throughout the week. Um, if you need any points of clarification, have any good ideas for future research. So today was a bit more of just a, like a spitballing type of day. Just sort of wanted to get my ideas out there nothing is like set in stone yet i still have a lot of thinking to do about all of this just sort of wanted to get these rough ideas out there so that we can start to polish them up as a group so thank you all thank you thank awesome you. well you have guys. a productive week all right bye keep your noses to the grindstone and have fun <laughs> bye now mm -hmm.